Hey there, welcome to a brand new episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in this week's vlog you will see my interview with John O'Callaghan in which he shares a story behind his classic Big Sky. But before we start with the interview, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and very important, also make sure to click the bell button because then you will get a notification the next time a new vlog is online. All right, here it is, the story behind Big Sky, my interview with John O'Callaghan. Enjoy. John O'Callaghan is an Irish DJ, producer and label owner who's active in the music scene for many years already. He is known for productions and collabs under various project names and he did remixes for big names such as Armin van Buren, Solar Stone, Giuseppe Altaviani, Cosmic Gate, The Thrill Seekers, Garrett Emery, Lange and many many others. For this week's vlog I sat down with John to ask him about the story behind his classic Big Sky, a track he did together with singer-songwriter Audrey Gallagher. Big Sky came out with a massive remix from Agnelli and Nelson and it even became the tune of the year at the end of 2007 in Armin van Buren's radio show A State of Trance. My first question to John was how old he was when he started to listen to music. Wow, um, when I started to listen to music, um, well music has always been in my household growing up. I always remember one of the, the first records uh, was an old uh, Dire Straits record, the, the classic Dire Straits album that my dad had. And then there was uh, like number one hits of the 80s, tapes all was around the house. Um, status Quo, ACDC was, was big stuff for me when I was uh, very young. And uh, then from there, I uh, slowly got into dance music, mainly through uh, going on uh, holidays to Spain. Um, Spain is a popular destination for a lot of Irish people as uh, when you're going on your summer holidays, I suppose, with your family. but. All the time when I went to Spain you would have uh, the tracks of the summer which would be played all the time in the local bars and disco and at that time it was uh, people like the Chemical Brothers and Faithless um, as well as some of the, uh, the the pop tunes that would have been in the chart like like Anne Lee and Two Times you know like stuff mm -hmm. that was kind of borderline dance music and that's how I first kind of got interested in, in that kind of a beat you know like that kind of a tempo so I would come home from uh, my holidays and then I would go and, and search out the tracks. They would be on the radio at the time, an old cassette tape deck where you would record your favourite tracks. And uh, I would make my own tapes of the, the tracks of the summer that time and uh, listen back to them combined with the memory of the holidays. And uh, from, from there, I suppose, uh, then I, I got more serious into dance music when um, the internet became more available. The internet wasn't a thing un until I was a teenager and um, then uh, I was uh, listening to uh, CDs like Ministry of Sound, um, the Gay Crasher CDs, which I, I didn't know anything about. I didn't even know there were nightclubs, I just would buy the CDs because uh, they were in the dance music section of the, the shop in the small town that I lived in. So I would start off uh, buying um, those CDs and then I would move on to a little bit more advanced stuff like um, what was the name of the CDs that Danny Tanaglia and Seb Fontaine used to do the Around the World ones? Oh, and not, not Global Underground? Yeah, Global yeah, Underground. Global yeah, Global, Global Underground. Underground. I, I then got into that series and expanded from um, trance into listening to people like Danny Tanaglia, Danny Howells, Seb Fontaine, and that was around the time when I was doing my. Um, exams in school, um, when I was probably around 16, 17 and I would listen to those CDs on headphones when I was studying for my exams. So I got to know the CDs and the music very well through lots of lots of listening over and over. And um, yeah, then slowly got into going to nightclubs myself when I got to 18 years old. It wasn't, uh, uh, it was hard to get into nightclubs without the, the right ID where I lived so I had to wait until I was 18 and then discovered real clubbing and and trance music and techno and all the rest yeah. of it. And, and was it also around the same time when you started to make your own music? I was always um, very into uh, technology and computers my whole life uh, you know I've, I, I've had a PC since Windows first was a thing um, and uh, being on the internet in the in the early days, those you know the forums like the old school message boards, yeah. where um, I would be uh, talking to other people in in uh, the same kind of 
people interested in the same kind of stuff, trance and uh, clubbing in Dublin. And uh, I would have been on a board in Dublin for clubbing and I was on a, a board of in the UK for uh, clubbing as well. And then I discovered Trance Addict, which was uh, a bunch of people similar to me trying to make music, but not really knowing 100% how to do it. And uh, that was a massive resource for me to, to meet a lot of people and discover a lot of um, techniques that I wouldn't have known about or like I don't even think YouTube no, there were no tutorials was around YouTube. then, no, 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 there was nowhere to go only to speak to people and um, I, uh, Google wasn't around then either, it was Yahoo and stuff like that mm -hmm. so it's even search engines were, were difficult to find the methods of, of what you needed to do, it was always a bit mysterious back then, mm -hmm. you never even knew yeah. what you even much were looking for but you knew what I wanted to sound like. So I, I started making very average amateur stuff on um, very simple programs like EJ or DJ Rave, you know, super simple stuff that wasn't even uh, possible to make good music on. But, uh, but I learned the basic sequencing yeah. from stuff like that. And then I moved on to eventually uh, a program called Reason. And uh, a lot of producers on Trans Addict at the time were using Reason, so you'd have lots of help and guys giving you advice and there might be some sound banks or files that you could um, share between uh, guys who are who are more experienced in the program than me. But I, I learned that from, from the ground up, um, not really knowing exactly what I was doing either. And then slowly moved on to uh, Cubase eventually, you know, that was like like the big step mm -hmm. up from, from um, one particular sound to a whole realm of other possibilities where VSTs were a thing, you know, like I didn't know what a VST mm -hmm. was yeah, until yeah. I discovered Cubase. But my uncle uh, was uh, and still is, uh, has always been in music in the, uh, the kind of the TV and uh, Irish music production uh, background, like, um, like traditional Irish artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a studio out his back garden, which is, was his full time job. And I would always go there and he would say to me, you need to get on Cubase, Cubase is what you need. So I think he gave me my first uh, version of Cubase when he was finished with. And I installed that and uh, began the process of learning everything all over again because uh, it's a whole new program. So there was, a, there was a big period of years of learning, you know, and uh, consuming information to try and get to the, where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm which suited my um, kind of uh, personality of being interested in technology because all that stuff was super interesting to me. It wasn't like work, I, it was my hobby. And um, through there met, met people like, like Brian Carney, Neil Scarborough, um, all, all the other Irish producers and, and, and of course people like Fila and eventually Giuseppe and uh, started making some semi-decent tracks which um, got a little bit of interest on forums people were saying oh this this guy is making okay stuff you know not not by any means signable but uh better than it used to be mm -hmm. uh, but it was a very long curve for me i had a lot of tracks that were rubbish you know mm -hmm. before you still you still have them yeah i don't know they're, they're probably on a cdr somewhere in my uh, oh, yeah. in my attic i have a load of old cdrs with that on it that i haven't looked at in a long time but some of the tracks I, I probably even forgot about, yeah, but yeah. but I was every time I was making a track I was learning something, you know, and I, I wasn't sending them to labels at that point because they weren't good enough, and um, I was still in college, completing a four-year degree, so it was my hobby, and um, towards the end of the four years degree of college in the last year I kind of got to the point where uh, other DJs were playing my tracks. Uh, I used to send my tracks on CDR in the post, old school, um, to uh, DJs like Matt Hardwick, Robbie Nelson of Agnelli Nelson and uh, Les Hemstock were the three first guys that kind of actually played my tracks. I can't remember who else sent it to, probably Judge Jules, a lot of the big guys at the time I, I somehow got addresses, actual postal addresses, yeah. I think they were probably PO boxes. Yeah. yeah. And I would send tracks to a bunch of guys and eventually a couple of people started to write back by email. And that was a, a big door opener for me because I, I actually I got a confidence boost by saying, well, they're actually playing it. And uh, that encouraged me then to go to try and make more, to, to get them to, to play more tracks, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Um, at the time I was working part time in a, a movie shop like Blockbuster I suppose would be the equivalent in Ireland, you know, a DVD rental store. And uh, I was 21, 22 then, I was getting uh, a few small gigs in Ireland that I, I wasn't even really ready to do because I wasn't in my mind uh, somebody who wanted to be on stage. I was very much into the technology and the, the music side of it. But um, gigs kind of came my way and I, I said to them at the time, I'm not sure about doing them, maybe, maybe this is not for me. And the guy just ended up putting me on the flyer anyway and he said, well, you have to do it yeah. now. So uh, that was um, that was in the last year of school and when I finished school, I was very much like my mind was, I'm looking for a job. I've just done four years of a computer degree course, software engineering, and uh, I need to go in there and find a normal job. And that's what my parents wanted me to do mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. They were like, would you ever stop yeah. pressing buttons in there and go and get a job? <laughs> so. Um, at that time, it kind of just crossroads at the same time as to where I started getting offered uh, better gigs in the UK, like paid gigs that were, you know, working out around the same as what I would have been earning in the computer industry at the time, I suppose, starting off. I was getting gigs in places like Sirius at the Cross in London, uh, Good Grief, I, I got a few early God's Kitchen sets, uh, Passion in Colville. So, I was at a I was at a situation where I needed to either continue down that path or continue down the path of uh, being a computer engineer, and uh, that was when I got a phone call from a DJ agency in the UK uh, called Fresh DJs, and uh, they rang my parents' house. <laughs> when like my, my your mum or dad picks up the mm -hmm. phone, hello, John, it's for you, some fella from England. So uh, I had no idea how that worked. I was like so inexperienced. I was like, so what? Like I go and get on a plane and I DJ and then what, you pay me or what do I do? I don't know, you know, pure basics. I had no idea how it worked. Um, so I decided to give it a try. I said to my mom and dad, I'm going to do this for six months. And if it's not working out after six months, I'll, I'll go and get a job. So uh, that, was, that was the beginning of uh, starting off the DJ, but it, it was heavily linked to the help of um, uh, Judge Jules, Ma Hardwick, Les Hemstock and mainly Agnelli and Nelson because um, it was Agnelli and Nelson that uh, recommended me to the DJ agency because they were playing at the time a few tracks of mine. One of the tracks they were playing was um, Manix Mercury, which was the first track I got signed to Armada um, on the Estate of Trance label. So, um, it was if it was not for sending out those CDs to those guys, I would have never got signed as a DJ or got anywhere. So a lot of knocking on doors eventually. Yeah. So then you would still have been like a computer engineer, probably. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, for this interview, we're going to talk about your track uh, "Big Sky," for which you worked together with singer-songwriter Audrey Gallagher. Uh, first things first, can you tell how you got to meet Audrey? Well, that links into the story I was just telling there, which is. Um, um, Gnelli and Nelson were heavily supporting my tracks and eventually I got friendly with them on a, on a gig basis. I would see them at gigs and um, they were playing a, a bunch of my tracks and I, I was obviously um, massive fans of them and always very curious about what happened in their studio because they were using Logic and I always remember that on their MySpace or, or whatever the social media at the time they used to have a picture of their studio. And I always thought I wouldn't mind seeing what that's like. So I think I asked Chris Agnelli one time, is there any way I can go up for a day to your studio? And he very generously said, yeah, no problem. And, and that turned into me going up there quite regularly to uh, spend time in, in the lad's studio where uh, Chris and Robbie would actually give me like one-to-one -one tuition. Actually, when I look back on it now, you know, massive massive uh, opportunity to, to learn that information from them, very generous of them to do so. And I would spend three, four days up there and Chris would tell me all his stories mm -hmm. of, of DJing and, and tracks and what to do and what not to do and, and a lot of technical stuff where we were listening to uh, bands like the Pesh Mode and the Jacksons and like listening to mix downs and the spread of instruments between different areas in the track and that's all stuff that blew my mind because I was literally just 
dropping and dragging and dropping sounds and hoping that somehow at the end it, ca it came out to be good <laughs> yeah, but that like, would be a good track <laughs> you know chris taught me that how to write a song rather than uh, a track you know mm -hmm. like uh, we spent a lot of time listening to the pesh mode which i was never really uh, into until i met chris and from there I, I went and listened to the pesh mode and that influenced my music going further than that but yeah in in terms of um meeting audrey obviously at the time um Agnelli and Nelson had Holding On To Nothing, which was huge and everybody was playing it. And I, th I at the time and still now I thought like that's just an incredible track. Like how do you even begin to make something that, that special? Like where does it start? So um, I was asking Chris like what's the process there? How do you, how do you uh, find a vocalist like that? And how do you make the music to, for it to all gel together? And he said, that um, you know, a lot of it is to do with luck, which it is. I know that now myself. But um, I said to him after after I had been in the studio a few times, I said, "What are the chances of me maybe doing a track with Audrey?" You know, I didn't expect anything to happen. I just asked, "Do you think it's possible?" And he said, "Well, it's not impossible, but before um, before I even ask her, you're going to have to go and make a track that's that's so good that." when she hears it, she's gonna to want to do it mm -hmm. because you can't just knock, say knock, knock, let's do a track and you don't have anything ready. So he said, go back to your studio and start working on what you believe could be something she would sing on. So um, I, I took that as a big challenge and I went back home and, um, and then I started listening to all my favorite vocal tracks over the years and started like bullet pointing what the, what the things are that I want and uh, you know chord changes and, and vibes and build ups and, and elements and um, I thought to myself well I um, holding on to nothing was already a, a, a big 140 138 transfer so I'm going to just go a little bit different here to to not just do the same thing um, and I decided to do uh, what was my effort at a kind of a Gabriel and Dresden style um, as the rush comes kind mm -hmm. of a 130 BPM track and if you listen to um, the original mix of Big Sky you'll hear a lot of Gabriel and Dresden influences yeah. there. So I spent probably six to eight months making that um, but not having the vocal in my head mm -hmm. because vocalists, uh, you know, the good vocals always come directly from them. You can't say sing this. So I was making the uh, the verse and the chorus and adjusting sounds and I was putting in all the big effects and listening to tracks like As The Rush Comes and tra and all the big Gabby and Dresden tracks at the time that Tiesto used to play. But what was that other one? And then? That's it. Beautiful and then, things? And or then, other, other things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was listening to all those and analysing everything and, and, and kind of scientifically trying to come up with my recipe of, of that kind of stuff. and. Um, at the time, I, I, I was beginning to um, understand Cubase and uh, be, be able to manipulate the sounds to get what I wanted out of them. I was at a kind of a good crossroads between uh, what I was doing before and what, what I was learning going forward. And it was kind of a hot spot of um, inspiration, you know, and I, I came up with this, I don't know, was it eight, nine minutes long original track? And um, I sent it to Chris. I said, here it is go and see does, she, does is there any chance you know maybe she'll like it maybe she won't and he he straight away was surprised by the fact that it was 130 bpm mm -hmm. i said well i just didn't want to uh, do what you done uh, let's 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 see what she thinks of this maybe something will come from it and um i never actually spoke to audrey myself at the time chris was talking to her for me and uh i don't believe i had emailed her or or talked to her on the phone but eventually what happened one day was a CDR got posted to my house in my studio um, in a padded envelope and I opened it and it was like a white CDR and it said on it like Big Sky Vocals, you know, and I was like, what's this? Like, I don't know what this is. And um, I rang Chris, I was like, I got a CDR here with vocals on it. Is this Audrey? He was like, yeah, go and see what you think of it. So um, the, the the vocals that are on Big Sky now are the vocals from that CDR. Oh, really? they, were, they were never retook or edited or anything. It was literally just get the vocal, put it on the track, and like when I heard it, it was just like, 
you know, it was magic. Yeah, I was, you, you knew you had something special. I was like, wow, I did not expect yeah. it to be that good. You yeah. know, like she really knocked it out of the park. Lyrics and vocals and, and all the little melodic kind of uh, phrases mm -hmm. that she, she done in it. Like, so, you know, Big Sky is massively Audrey Gallagher, you know, yeah. but without her, obviously it's nothing. So I'm always thankful to Audrey for, you know, allowing me to, to, to work with her and to to get to create what eventually became Big Sky was um, lucky, as Chris said in the first place, you need a bit of luck, but you also got to, uh, you know, write a track that you believe is good enough, which which really worked out because um, had I not put that time into it, maybe she wouldn't have liked it and, yeah. and that never would have happened. And, and without Big Sky, that was the stepping stone to 20 other things in my career, yeah. you know, so. Thankful to Chris Agnelli, Robbie Nelson, and, and uh, Audrey Gallagher for, for that situation. So, so what kind of equipment did you use for the track? Uh, Big Sky was, um, as I said, Cubase on a, on a PC, Windows XP, really old, no updates. Um, I was using, the hardware I was using at the time was primarily the Virus Ti, which I had been recommended from Thomas Bronzeware who we know very well. And um, I was kind of at the point where I was um, like really digging into that synth and like I had like a hundred um, presets that I had saved myself, my own versions of them and tweaked and saved for when I'm going to mm -hmm. use them. And they kind of all went into that uh, Big Sky original. And uh, percussion wise, they're, they're just, um, you know, separate sample packs, but, but very much going for that kind of Gabriel and Dresden uh, groove on the percussion and the synths, um, just lots of reverb and delay and like, you know, the, the side chain in the right place to create that kind of, um, I suppose at the time, uh, if, if you if you look back at the kind of, at the trance that was being played then, there was a lot of um, Cosmic Gate and Marcus Schultz, big vocals uh, above and beyond. And it was, it was more based around kind of a, a layering atmosphere of sounds rather than one particular lead. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got this kind of washing sound, which is what I went for. It doesn't have, like Big Sky doesn't really have a defining melody. It's kind of all the elements together yeah. that uh, that make it what it is. But yeah, other, other synths, um, VST wise, I, I used to use at, at, uh, atmosphere loads. I used to use everything in atmosphere. Um, trilogy for bass lines that was my kind of bass line go to and just a couple of very simple uh, sounds from since like v station and vanguard that i like i would have my own banks of of sounds that i would they have no order whatsoever but i would know what sound was yeah. where and i would be saving sounds for a particular day and then i would go and use it um so yeah that's that's how um you know software wise and hardware there, there wasn't a lot in it and um the PC was just a basic PC off the shelf, you know, nothing, nothing special. And and, this, and the room I made it in didn't even have any soundproofing. It was just a square room, white paint on the walls. So uh, yeah, look, got lucky there again. Rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Big Sky came out with a remix from McNally and Nelson. You already uh, mentioned to them. So did, did you suggest them, or was it like done by the label? Well, actually, the the story behind that one is um, I finished the original. Uh, sent it to Chris, he probably gave me a little bit of advice in terms of mixing vocals or getting things 100%. I then um, very proudly sent the track to the two labels at the time that I thought I would love it to be on. And uh, both of the labels, I didn't hear back from them for a few weeks and I kind of like very politely asked again, like, is there any interest there in the track? Because I had let a couple of my friends here and they were like, oh no, like that's your that's a winner, you know, hundred mm -hmm. percent. Like it's you've 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 struck gold there, you know. And I was like very hopeful to, to be hearing something good in return. But um actually both labels at the time said that they weren't interested in the original mix. And I was devastated and couldn't understand it and you start kind of thinking to yourself, oh Am I hearing something there or not, or vice versa? You know, maybe if I give them a few weeks, maybe they'll change their mind. So I went back to Chris Agnelli and I said, no, they said no. And he couldn't believe it. He was like, what the, how can that be? So I said, maybe 
what about do we need a remix to go with it so it's not 130 on its own we have a 130 and what if you do the 140 remix of it you know like very hopefully asking him didn't think he'd, he'd say yes but once again Chris and Robbie being as sound as they are said oh, okay give us the files and uh, they went and, and made the uh, Agnelli and Alson remix of it which at the time I was kind of asking them like can you make it holding on to nothing so because like obviously that's a winner and uh, that would be the perfect complement to the 130 progressive version so they went and did that and then I believe at the time um, Chris had direct contact with Armin who was playing a lot of Agnelli and Nelson uh, remixes and music at the time and Chris I think got it to Armin directly and um, the same kind of situation happened we didn't hear back for two three maybe four weeks or a month um, and I believe at the time what was happening was Armin was doing a tour of South America and it was obviously before um, videos and streams and stuff yeah. were, were happening where you knew what a DJ was playing everywhere they played so you'd only hear third or fourth hand stories about oh I heard um, this track got played at this show you'd never hear until a few days or weeks later and um, I think what happened was Armin was uh, testing it out in South America and um, it was going down very well and um, the feedback then came through the label to um, the, they did want it eventually and um, that's what became the original and the Agnelli and Nelson remix and, and thanks to Armin playing in South America and, and getting the reactions it did it then ended up on his own Armoyans label which was the, the icing on the cake for me because mm -hmm. I, I always wanted a track on Armoyant and to have the artwork at the little, uh, the little cartoon yeah, guy yeah, in front yeah, yeah, you know yeah. that was always something I, I thought I would love to have but never never t thought what happened so you know uh, Big Sky was you know only for Ignati and Elson uh, and, and Chris especially reaching out to Armin and getting that remix to him um, you know a lot to thank for uh, yeah. there and, and it just goes to show you that trance as a community really does help each other you know that's I wasn't doing that on my own no way if I didn't have the help of, of the people who I knew to open those doors it would have never happened. Yeah, the track did pretty well, you know, uh, yeah, Armin was playing it, you already mentioned him, uh, Ferry Corson, Above and Beyond, Garrett Emery, Marcus Schulz, Alian Fila and many, many others. It even became the tune of the year in a state of trance. So did you expect the track to become so big? No, to be honest with you, because if you, if you actually look at the tracks that were in that tune of the year list that year, there's some massive tunes that are still huge now. And I think the track may have gotten released in the summertime and I can't exactly remember what was the release date it was maybe released in June or July and the track of the year vote is in December usually mm -hmm. so I thought it's not going to yeah, it's, not by then it will have kind of faded off a little bit but actually instead of fading it off it just went up and got more popular and more popular and it was just one of those tracks that a lot of people could uh, connect to on the dance floor and in a club and it had a very unique identity in terms of the vocals and um, yeah, still to this day people ask me to play it and, and it has a lot of meaning to people yeah. and... Do people get angry when you don't play it? I wouldn't say, not, not to my face anyway, <laughs> maybe they say it when I'm not there but yeah, people w want me to play it and I, and I nine times out of ten do yeah. play it because if I go and see my favourite band and I don't hear don't that track, it. it's, yeah. it is disappointing but there's the other side of the fence where people will say, oh would you ever stop playing that track? But yeah. Where do you where do you go? Yeah. You know, it's, you can't please everybody. There's no win there, but I, I do try and play it. And uh, for it getting tune of the year, I you know that was incredible. That was like you know, that was like the World Cup for me. You know, winning yeah. the World Cup final, I couldn't believe it. Um, I remember the nights when the votes were getting read out, and I was like, okay, eight, it's not there yet. Seven, it's not there. What does that mean? It's not in it at all. Mm -hmm. Seven, six, five, and and, and eventually got to number one. And um, I have the. Uh, final at home with the top the, the list of the oh, top yeah, tracks yeah. and a kind of a big me memory memorabilia thing that I just beside my studio and every time I walk past it it kind of just reminds me that yeah. of, of that time which is uh, you know a very special time in my career and and um, getting the DJ now again with with Agnelli and Alison and and the, the people that helped me back then it's, it's great to see them and us everybody back on the road again you know yeah 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 so yeah was music a full-time job for you already around that time no, it wasn't. I was, 
I actually then it was when I was making Big Sky yes it was because um, I had um, finished college when I was 21, 22 and I believe I made Big Sky when I was 26 maybe um, so I was traveling around DJing small gigs playing playing the lower lower slots like mm-hmm. the late slots and, and kind of earning my earning my, my stripes as they say um, I used to play in turn mills in London at 6 yeah. to 8 in the morning I used to play Good Grief last I was always last or first you know so I'd done that for years mm-hmm. playing in the arches in, in Glasgow p- coming over to Holland playing loads of gigs always very late and um, enjoying it and, and being grateful for it you know and, and very slowly worked my way up the ladder through making some other tracks that were that were uh, successful not as successful as big sky but you know you can't recreate yeah. magic just at the drop of a hat you gotta wait for it to kind of come your way sometimes earlier this year the underwear yell remix of big sky came out um, have you ever thought about remixing it yourself like maybe under one of your other project names such as uh, joint operation center or even henrik zuberstein <laughs> Well, there actually is a, a joint operation center. Oh, there's one already. Of it. Yeah, that came out a couple of years after the original. Uh, so I, I've been playing that for a few years. But um, in terms of a progressive mix of it, probably not, no, because the original would be very close to it. Yeah. Um, I'm happy for other people to have a go at remixing it, like, like Andrew Ariel done a great job. I'm sure there's other versions of it out there that uh, eventually will, will, will be good too. But. I don't think I need to go back there again, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, ha- I'm happy with the, yeah. the two or three versions we have. Yeah. So right now your new track, uh, The Oat, with uh, Factor B just came out. Um, how are the reactions on that one so far? Really good, yeah, that's um, uh, my track with Brandon Factor B, um, who, uh, who is known for his long breakdowns uh, and his uh, kind of classic trance sound. And uh, we have been talking for a while about doing a collab and I knew that when I was going to do one with him, I had to be the original kind of gay crasher god's kitchen mm-hmm. uk trance sound that uh, we made entirely over the uh, internet because the pandemic was happening so we couldn't actually meet up um but yeah that was a long process and uh, and an enjoyable one because both of us weren't uh, working as such so we had tons of studio time to to put into it um started off as a melody that uh, brendan wrote and sent it to me and then i kind of stripped back half of it probably and, and kind of just condensed it into a more I suppose uh, my style of, mm-hmm. of a melody and then sent it back to him and he added stuff on top like the choirs and the piano and then uh, that just happened back and forth for six months until we, we got what eventually has become the final track and uh, reactions have been really good to it because it's not yeah, your typical trance track that's coming out these days it is a little bit more classic uh, sound and maybe that's the way maybe that's the way things are going you know yeah. but it certainly works in the club and i'm um, very much looking forward to hearing it tonight yeah yeah same here so um, yeah uh, the old was a call up at factor b um, can we expect any new collaborations in the near future uh, yes that's there's always collaborations happening and um, one of my favorite things in trance is working with other people um you know to me working on my own in the studio versus with somebody is a completely different um inspiration level always working with somebody else it's just more fun you know uh so um at the moment i'm i'm thanks to your video back working with uh, thomas bronzer um myself and thomas have been friends a long long time but he went down the path of uh, his career and and wasn't doing trans for oil and i got i went down i went very down the path of of uh, the trans career so we kind of lost touch for oil mm-hmm. but um we're back in touch now and and uh, hearing some of the stuff he's making and and uh talking on email and text a lot and uh, we decided we're, we're going to work again on a, a new lost world track which has already started and you should hopefully hear it early next year um also going to do a track with schneider and um, we haven't actually started it yet though um i have um collabed on with dear drummer glocklin and a new vocal track that's finished i'm gonna play that one tonight most likely that'll be coming out early next year um i was planning on playing it at the uh, estate of trance festival celebration but unfortunately it got cancelled so a, a few tracks got moved back because um that's always the best place to play new music yeah yeah so um that didn't happen i was ready to uh, debut a few things at that so i have um a couple of other vocal tracks finished which um, i'm not going to to uh, give details on because it's too early yeah and um 
I don't want them to uh, you know, spoil all the surprises. Yeah, like, let's yeah. let's see how they go. Maybe they're not even finished. I'm going to play them and see. Do I need to work on them a bit more? And uh, still, I was working with Brian on uh, I keep 40, 50 tracks all the time. And uh, we have a few shows coming up. Actually, a state of trance Mexico is just announced. Yeah. So we're going to be going there and um, maybe um, even have a new vocal track for early next year as well. But just about spacing things out and, and um, trying to get uh, inspiration, keeping going in studio all the time now that we're traveling again, the, the schedule is very different. Yeah. Uh, but being back in the clubs and, and seeing all our friends and, and fans and, and trans family, yeah. as they say, you know, is, is massive mm -hmm. for the inspiration in the studio. And uh, I'm really enjoying it and I yeah. can't wait for tonight. So, so you're going to see Factor B tonight? Yeah, he's playing before yeah, me. Yeah. Is this going to be the first time you see each other like since the since you No, I seen I seen Brandon actually at uh, Creamfields and uh -huh. and Manchester last week. Yeah. We we tend to be on lineup sometimes. Yeah. Similar. So uh, I have seen him and uh, he's delighted with how the track's going and his album. If you haven't heard it, you should go and get it. Anybody out there? Yeah, go and get Brandon. Yeah. Sounds great. Theater of the mind. Yeah. So uh, out of all your own productions, what, what what is your favorite one? I know it's a difficult question, but. Well, that's that is a difficult question because I do ha I have made different styles over the years in terms of uh, trance, uplifting, progressive, and I I really can't say you know I, I can't say because this, this, some of them just have different meanings for me at different points in my life. Um, but I suppose if you if you were to kind of condense it and look at look at my career and and what what led to so many doors opening, it probably would be Big Sky, yeah. you know, because that was the um, the spark of, of what, what led to being able to continue DJing as a career because if that didn't happen maybe I would be working in a, a server room fixing computers now, who knows. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, the, you know, trance for me is always about learning and changing and, and um, constantly kind of testing yourself and, and trying different sounds all the time instead of just making the same thing over and over. You know, obviously sometimes you do make tracks that style-wise do <laughs> overlap a little bit but one thing I've always tried to do is is not get caught in the same um, template all the time yeah, and, and to be based. Yeah, just 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 if that's happening, you know, take a break, go listen to some of your favorite music, and then come back to it and try. You know, delete your old files. Don't keep opening your old files. Just delete and start fresh. And that's what I love about trance and dance music and traveling around the world and seeing people and meeting new producers and seeing the path that they're on now. You know, I feel like uh, the help that Chris Agnelli gave me, my Hardwick and Les Hamstock, I want to now give that help to, to the new guys coming through and that, that gives me great hope as well and I get great satisfaction out of seeing guys starting off and, and coming up you know, similar to, to the way I did because if I didn't have that help I wouldn't be here either. Yeah, true. So do you still have something on your bucket list music-wise? I've always wanted to do a track with Jess Breeden. Oh. And it never happened. So that's one thing I still want to do. That's been on the list a long, long time. That should be possible. Yeah, yeah, I, I've tried, but I'm going to have to keep trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the last question, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, big pizza. fan of Hawaiian. Oh, <laughs> Same here. Well, thank you very much for your time and good luck with everything. Thanks very much, Tuan. Good to see you. All right, that was it. This week's vlog, my interview with John O'Callaghan and the story behind Big Sky. John, thank you very much for your time, much appreciated. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to give this video a like, leave a comment in the comment section below, and very important, make sure to subscribe. Also make sure to click the bell button, because then you will get a notification the next time a new vlog is online. Once again, thanks for watching, and until next time, bye bye.